Growing up in North Wales, the myths and folk tales that I heard in my youth were not, in my mind, set in some distant, unreachable fantasy land. They were here, around me. In fact, my teachers often spoke about some of our myths as if they were elements of history itself. I believed wholeheartedly that Branwen married the Irish king Matholoch in the very village that I grew up in, Abefrau, that her giant brother Bendy Gaedvran genuinely did cross the Irish Sea by foot, and that Hintekid was home to a powerful witch, and that the fairies would gather upon moonlit nights to dance under sacred oak trees. I have always valued the importance of connecting to the land around us, seeing the very magic present in a sunset, a deep forest, a gentle summer breeze, a tempestuous winter storm, or in the might of an ancient standing stone. Whenever a new pagan or witch would ask me how to connect deeper to the mysteries and the magic of our land, our gods and our spirits, I always said, start with the land, go to the places where these stories took place, immerse yourself in the Tirlin Chwedlonol, the mythic landscape. However, problems arose when my reach began to broaden, when the exact same question of how do I connect to the magic of the Celtic cultural continuum came from those who were hundreds if not thousands of miles away. It's rather difficult to tell someone from Ontario or Minnesota or Melbourne to simply hop on over to Hintekid to commune with Keritwen, or to visit Hinnevan Vach in order to understand the story and the mysteries woven into that tale better. <laughs> so where does one go? How does one connect? Kroiso, welcome. This is the Welsh Witch Podcast. My name is Mara Starling. I'm a witch from Ynysmon, the Isle of Anglesey. And here on the Welsh Witch Podcast, I explore the spirits, magic and lore of the land upon which I was raised, Cymru, Wales, along with some delightful guests. Today's episode delves into some of those aforementioned questions. How does one connect to a stream of magic and spirituality that has its roots in a specific culture and location if one does not live immersed within that culture or that location? Joining me today is the incomparable Jenna Talundre. Oh, how I adore Jenna. Her work is absolutely divine. And if you've not read any of her books, do pick some up. Jenna is the founder of the Sisterhood of Avalon, a goddess-centred tradition which reveres many of the Welsh goddesses at their core. She holds an MA in Celtic Studies and is the author of many books such as Avalon Within, The Pagan Portals Rhiannon and Blodewedd, and her most recent book, the Ninefold Way of Avalon. As well as touching upon connecting to the spirits of Wales from afar, we also explore some Welsh goddesses such as Arianrod, Rhiannon, and Blodewedd. We wax lyrically about our love for Welsh legend and lore, and overall we just have a jolly good time. Here in Wales, when we grab a cuppa, a cup of tea, we don't say cuppa. Up in the north of Wales, we say Panad. Tisha Panad? Tisha Panad? Do we need Panad? Tisha in? We say Panad. Now, Panad is essentially a word that means a cup of tea, but it can also just mean any hot beverage of your choice. So, sit back, grab a Panad, and I hope you enjoy this latest episode of the Welsh Witch Podcast. <laughs> So welcome, Jenna, to the Welsh Witch Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing really well. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. 
Oh, I'm so glad that you, I'm good thank you I'm doing really well <laughs> I'm just very glad that you agreed to come on to talk to me because I am going to pick your brain so much about so many things so for those of you who might be listening who um, have never heard of Jenna where have you been <laughs> have you been hiding under a rock <laughs> uh, so Jenna I've been reading your books since long before I even you know exploded onto the world of witchy social media with my strange videos um, and I remember I remember when I came across your, the first books of yours that I came across were The Pagan Portals, Rhiannon and Buldewedd. I remember Christopher, who is a mutual friend's, friend of ours, uh, had shared them and I instantly grabbed them online. I also bought them as gifts for my friends one year mm. for Christmas. So it's strange now just like thinking that a couple of years ago, I was just reading your books and you were just this entity that I looked up to and now we're sat across from each other having a chat (laughs) so I'm very thankful you've agreed to come on so before we dive right into the questions I have for you I thought I'd give you the opportunity to just tell us a little bit about yourself a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do well thank you um and I really appreciate uh, this this is fun for me I'm an old so don't do the TikTok. But um, so I am from New York City. Uh, I, li- uh, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I did my undergraduate work at university in archaeology. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, I completed a master's degree in Celtic studies from the University of Wales. And I love all things Welsh culture. Um, I am the inadvertent founder of the Sisterhood of Avalon. And that uh, we found it that started in uh, 1995. Um, so we're almost at our 30, 30 year anniversary. So we've been doing this a lot. I've written a bunch of books. I have a third one coming out on Avalon next month. I've written a few um uh, books on uh, Welsh goddesses, I, as you mentioned, Blodaiwedd and Rhiannon, and I also have an oracle deck. So I've been really um, connected to this work and doing it for a long time, and uh, it's um, it's been my privilege and honor to do so. Perfect. And one question I always have for people when they come onto the, the, the podcast is, what connection do you specifically have to Wales? What drew you to Wales and what, why, why Wales of all places? Christopher asked me that once too. How does that? A girl of Brooklyn descent, uh, of uh, Italian descent, re- born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, uh, come to this Welsh piece. And I really don't know. I don't have any, you know, family connection. I, I obviously don't live there. Um, I think King Arthur was probably my gateway drug. I was uh, very precocious and read a lot of Arthurian stuff very early in my life and my, you know, 11, 12, 13. Um, and that just kind of got me um, got me hooked and eventually made my way from all of those, uh, you know, the later myths and legends, you know, kind of worked my way backwards to source. Um, and I became pagan a couple of years. I was pretty young as well as 16. So, uh, so there was, there was always a very close connection between this, um, Arthurian, you know, Celtic, British piece and my spirituality. So they just, it was just a happy circumstance. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just all all roads lead to Wales for me. Oh gosh, Arthur is um, one of those things. One of those things. I shouldn't talk about him like that, really. But uh, the Arthurian cycles, I suppose I should say, are one of those things that I uh, am fearful of a little bit. And it's one of the reasons I'm so thankful for your work because, to me, I've always been a little tentative when it comes to approaching the Arthuriana stuff because I it's all it's a it's a little bit all over the place isn't it if if I hope that's fair to say um, I think that's more than fair to say <laughs> it's it's a little insane actually to pick all those threads apart so go on yeah and um I suppose one of the things that I'm really thankful to your work for especially because um you know, I've read some of your Avalonian uh based books and then the the most recent book I was privileged to have read a early advanced e-galley so the fact that your work is out there gives me that opportunity to see it through a new window through a new light because one of the areas that I always 
um, struggled with, I suppose, was how Arthur corresponds to the Welsh literature, because mm. I grew up with the Welsh medieval literature. We we were taught it in school. So mm. I remember being taught stories like Yarches Afanon, the Lady of the Fountain, which mm. of course um, starts with King Arthur at his court. And I remember being told stories like Kiloch and all and oh my gosh, the memories of sitting in that stuffy Welsh class in Escobedetan when I was in secondary school, having the teacher read us Kiloch Akolwen with all those names. <laughs> I had the court trauma. List. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! The wall of text, the medieval wall of text. Yeah, I and- have to say though, you're, you're 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 groaning, but for me, that's a little sounds like a little bit of heaven. <laughs> oh my to goodness! To be honest, but go ahead. I don't know what it is, but for some reason the teachers always seem to choose that we were going to read stories like Kill the Norwen, which have those really long prosy sections mm-hmm. with those long names and such just before we finished school for summer so it was always hot and it was always stuffy and you know when you reach the end of the school year you're already a bit like oh my gosh I'm burnt out and you're sat there while they're reading all these weird Welsh names to you um so to me that was my memory was that King mm-hmm. Arthur was part of our literature but that he was also something more because obviously mm-hmm. I also grew up with things like The Sword in the Stone from Disney and these other kind of Merlin movies oh I can't remember who that actor's called but there's the Merlin movie that has Queen Mab in it and um that one was quite formative for me Mm. and um to me it was always confusing because King Arthur was there present in the Welsh texts but there was also this almost propaganda like idea being pushed that no he's an English thing or a French thing (laughs) and so trying to like marry those two concepts so I'm really eternally grateful to you for I suppose bringing more light to these Mm. subject areas and maybe we'll have to do an episode again in future where we get more just to talk about Arthurian stuff Uh, but specifically you know the two books that I probably recommend the most from you and end up getting people to buy the most are likely the Blood Aweth and the Rhiannon books. There's also, um, I know it wasn't just your book, but the anthology devotional to Blood Aweth Flower Face. That's another one that I tell people to buy a lot. It's on my shelf somewhere behind me here. And, um, you know, for me, it was always just nice, not just to read something that has that scholarly vibe to it, where you can learn about these goddesses, but also from the perspective of someone who who devotes themselves to them and who works with them in a rather emotive sense, I suppose, if that's hmm. fair to say. So can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Welsh deities, uh, specifically going off of those two books, Rhiannon and Blodewer? I've been in devotional relationships with them for, for, for three decades. It's kind of, um, it's kind of a shocking to think about. These two goddesses have been very important in my life. I've worked with them for a very long time. And, um, and because I'm not where you are, it has been an interesting path to come into relationship with them. And, um, I, Bladiwith was actually the first. And, and, and to, and to be perfectly frank with you, I called her, this was in the early nineties. So there was no internet, no way to check. I called her Bloodwed for the first three years that I worked with her. And I found that it didn't, it wasn't an impediment to making these connections and learning. But when someone said, no, oh, honey, (laughs) that is not how you say your name. And using that name for the first time, it was transformative. It shifted so much. It opened up so much. So for me, that really, um, you know, brought home the power of that connection, the language connection, the cultural connection. And that shifted my practice, even just from knowing that one thing. So she always was Bladai with this, um, you know, just a, even a straight reading of her, of her, of her myth, uh, a, almost a feminist icon to me, you know, this person who uh, subverts the, you know, the, the overculture and chooses her own path uh, after being created for a specific purpose and discovering that she has choice that she has agency that she can, you know, be sovereign in her choices. Um, and, you know, even though she was punished at the end for those choices, which included, uh, you know, attempted murder of her husband, um, she was transformed into an owl, which to me was a symbol of wisdom. So, the, you know, I, I was very early on very interested and drawn to the, you know, the encoded kind of symbolism that was in there. Um, and, uh, and so, so, but 
it was later studies of connecting with her. I, I actually wrote my, my master's thesis on the fourth branch and Bladiwith as a seasonal sovereignty goddess, uh, really understanding the cultural context, the, uh, the, the law of the time, the, you know, what was expected, uh, how literature shifted, what the owl represented in a medieval context. And so, it introduced me to this idea of this stream of tradition, that these stories evolve over time as reflections of the cultures who carried on in, in orality. When it was written down in the medieval period, it was it was a reflection of that. And what we receive today and how we can be in, in relationship with them today is going to be a reflection of our own culture. But for it to communicate with that stream of tradition we have to know what happened before be grounded in 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 that uh in that mythos in order to have a clear reflection now and move forward so um yeah so i really i really appreciate um what she has to teach us about that sovereignty and before it was the owl to me that was the apex of her story that um, and you know, and, that, and the flower form was the was the weak thing, was the was the was the patriarchy. But now I think about it really differently. I I really get the sense that it was in her flower form that she took what she had, and that was the form in which she was able to transform her life. She used what was given her. She took those limitations and turned them into her strength, um, or manipulation, or however you want to look at it. But um, you know, it's all in perspective. So I think that the stories, so that's just Bodai, so you asked about Hryanan as well, but I'll, I'll stop for breath if you'd like. But I think that they grow with us in the same way they evolved over time in different cultural contexts. I, I've been with, with her for so long in my life and my relationship with her, my perspective of her, my uh, what she has to teach me continues to grow along with that. And I can't help but think it's a reflection of my own process as well. Yeah, I, I just... I love the the story of Blodeweth specifically because um, it's one that I was taught from a very young age. And instantly it's one of those stories that I fell in love with to the point where, to me, the fourth branch was about Blodeweth for mm. the longest time. Like I didn't really mm-hmm. care, as, as horrible as that sounds. When I was a teenager, when I was a kid, I didn't really care about the other characters. Blodeweth was the one that I was like, I love her. She's really cool. And I want more about her. And I remember um, a huge formative part of my youth was when I came across a um, fictional novel that acted as a sequel to the story called Dale Wen, which was about Bodeweth's sister who was made of leaves instead of flowers. And Ooh, wow. there's, yeah, there's a lot of those interpretive things that were part of my uh, strange perception of Bodeweth because um, I also watched, so this is probably the strangest story I always bring up to people about Blodeweth. Um, when I was in primary school, there was a traveling theatrical production company, a musical theater company who came to our school and they set up a little stage in our canteen and they performed the story of um, Blodeweth being created and mm. you know everything that entails from there as a theatrical production for us, as a musical as well. So they sang to us. And uh, there's a few visuals from that show that has stayed with me for all these years. So I think they might have um, stolen a little bit of uh, Olwen from Kilok and Olwen from it. And they they had this idea that everywhere Bladeweth steps, flowers sprout in her footprints. Um, so the actress, when she was walking, she would always be dropping flower petals as she walked, oh, which was gorgeous. I love that. Um, but the funniest thing, um, and I, I kind of laugh about it now, back then I loved it because I was a kid and I loved it. It was glorious. But when the uh, when the part of the story came where Bloodyworth was turned into an owl and she flies away, um, she sang the song. I can't remember what it's called. I think she, it's called Breakaway or something. The one where it's like, I'll spread my wings and I'll learn how to fly. <laughs> and... Oh my gosh, I always find that hilarious now. That song, I can't play it without thinking about Blood Aweb. But yeah, there's also Rhiannon, so I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on Rhiannon as well. Rhiannon herself has taken me on a really deep dive into the... um, uh, 
into her roots, where she comes from on the continent. And uh, it was in search of the mother. Um, and I saw it very much in it. I lost my mother almost um, almost 20 years ago. So I've been motherless for someone who's so invested in women's traditions and women's community and, you know, relationships between women um, to, to, to not have my mother all this time has been has been, um, you know, kind of you know, a struggle. And so there's a lot of process around that. And, you know, so coming to know Rhiannon's, you know, her, uh, her, 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 her broad back as a support in times of trouble, her, her wide lap to, you know, be a, a source of comfort. You know, that's the face of Rhiannon that I, that I, uh, that I've connected with and worked with the most, the most. And, um, you know, it's it's always interesting to see because she is in many ways cognate with the goddess, the Morrigan. You know, they both mean the great the great queen or the divine queen, and you know, is as sovereignty goddesses. You know, their their roles are to protect the land and and all of this. But you know, by the time the medieval stories are written, you know, in 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 Welsh tradition, she had no longer had that aspect in Irish tradition their their works are written down earlier she maintains that warlike um peace so I always wonder what that Rihanna was like uh that aspect of her and so you know tracing her back to Rigantona and you know some of the matres on on the continent to to see her her uh, stream of tradition as a confluence of, of many different things has been a fascinating process for me but in my work with her and my devotion with her she's she's always that she's the abundance the abundance mother um and she's a little cheeky she's got a good sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> yeah whenever I I do any kind of like talks or workshops or anything like that and someone asks me about Rhiannon they always I often get asked like who is Rhiannon in actual like Welsh law um because obviously and, and I think I'll segue into a, another figure from Welsh myth in a second um who I'd love to talk about who I didn't prep you for so Forgive me for that, but um, you know, like, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of people who are aware of the fact that a lot of these figures from Welsh myth have kind of been warped a little bit by more kind of new agey neo pagan mm-hmm. kind of ideas. So I know for me personally, one of the oh, it always makes mm-hmm. me sound like an awful person, but one of the main reasons I even came to TikTok at all. Uh, started making my TikTok videos because I was making YouTube videos and such about Welsh witchcraft and Welsh magic for a while. But one of the reasons I came to TikTok was because I downloaded it out of boredom during the lockdowns. And I was scrolling one day and I thought, I wonder if anybody does any videos on Welsh like goddesses and gods and magic. And I just searched Welsh goddess to see what would come up on the search. And there was a video by this person who was like... Um, Trianon is the Welsh goddess of witchcraft, magic, the moon, and sorcery. And I remember sitting there and going, is she? <laughs> and I thought to myself, <laughs> I'm going to make some videos because um, obviously TikTok needs it. <laughs> and I know that sounds awful, like I'm being critical of someone's uh, videos, but that is the idea that a lot of people have, that a lot of mm. these characters have been almost divorced from their original context and mm-hmm. put into a completely different context. And so when people ask me, so who's the real Rhiannon? Like, who's Rhiannon from the myths? I usually tell them to not be lazy and to just actually go and read the Mabinogi. But mm-hmm. then also I tell them, but you know, she's a bit she's a bit of a badass and she's a bit of, um, she, she has a bit of that Welsh wit to her. So, you know, one of the first lines she says is, you know, it would have been better for the horse if you'd asked that ages ago. <laughs> and to me, like, I can't help but read that in a very South Wales accent. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> So she has that kind of sass that a lot of South Walian women have. And yeah, I, I love her for that. But speaking of goddesses that have almost been taken out of their original context to become something new, um, and I just want to make clear, like, when they become something new, I'm of the opinion that often goddesses, gods, they take the shape of what we need them to be. So mm-hmm. if, for example, Rhiannon is taken out of her cultural context, there are certain circumstances where it bothers me, but there are also parts of me that sees it and goes... I can see why people want this and need Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And one goddess that I was for so many years very um, tentative about approaching in any capacity. So 
anybody who knows me and my work, I have not spoken about this goddess in my book. I've not spoken about her on my YouTube. Um, and it's you're, you're very, you'll be very hard pressed to find anything out there beyond my patron in the last month where I've spoken about this goddess, and that's Ariantrot. And I know that the Ninth Wave Press, is it, is coming out mm-hmm. with the Ariantrot devotional soon. So I'm just curious, who is Ariantrot to you? What What is your perception of Ariantrot or Ariantrot, however you prefer? So I know that uh, there's a lot of stuff around her name and the etymology of her name. Is she the silver wheel? Is she the, you know, the the, the fort mound? You know, there are there are those things um about her and i think i think that uh that idea of her being the silver wheel and uh so you know i check my sources all the time and you know you know some illuminaries are pretty pretty sure that uh, it is that rot is or hrod as opposed to the ra- the wrath you know the uh, r a t h from irish tradition my 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 welsh is bad my irish is worse so uh as far as pronunciation so please bear with me so I have always seen her. Yes. Um, you know, I know that the connection, you know, to be made with the moon is something that, you know, is not canonical. Um, but not really nothing is when it comes to some of these figures, because when the things were written down, they weren't gods anymore. But I think there's some contextual pieces to put in place here. I see her in her own way, um, as, uh, as, in the mold of those deities that are the testers, the testers of worth, the testers of heroes, sometimes this appositional thing, like, like Hera and Heracles, uh, you know, some of her, when you read some of the stories from Greek mythology, from a, the perspective that Hera isn't this, uh, and I think Ariane Hurt gets the same uh, kind of treatment. She's like, what is, what is her problem? Why is she, why is she so unpleasant? What, you know, why, why won't she take on this motherhood piece that, uh, you know, she just seems, um, you know, unreasonable. She's unreasonable, uh, unwomanly, unmotherly. Um, but I think that there is stuff encoded in there. I see her as the tester, the great teacher, um, who puts these, um, you know, she lays these destinies, the, the tinged. Um, I think if you look at what she's saying and, and, and there's, there's a whole cultural piece there too about the, the, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to bring everything back to feminism, but I think there is a tension and, and not just me, scholars believe this too. That's one of the things I loved about doing my program is that I'm reading these uh, journal articles and research papers and theses and books deconstructing these stories. And I, I, I see them as these theological pieces. And this is just them, you know, kind of unveil, you know, kind of getting granular with what the cultural context and meaning of things are. Um, at any rate, the, um, Oh, the idea of her as this um uh representing the old order, the the mother right, the matriline, and you know, the the tension between her and Gwydion, I think speaks to a, a, a cultural shift uh that is old because during when the story was written down, matriline wasn't being practiced in Wales. So this must have been an old narrative piece. So anyway, I see her as connected with fate and I see her as connected with cycles. I see her as the above and the below, the, you know, the Kairian Hrod, which is the Corona Borealis. And then, and then, the, you know, this submerged island. Um, I see her as being a, an otherworldly figure. She is a woman who has her own courts on an island off the coast. There's so many iterations of womanality that she has to be something more. And I do see her in this. Uh, there's so many um, pieces. I think her son, Plel, is being tested so that he can come into his godhood into not just his manhood but his godhood to be married to a a figure who is made from the land um so i see her as a tester i see her as connected with fate and with cycles um she's kind of a badass too absolutely um i think one of the reasons i was so tentative about approaching her was because there is so much out there about her and it was very hard to kind of differentiate who was the Ariantrod of original kind of, you know, within mm-hmm. the Welsh context and who is the more modern Ariantrod mm-hmm. uh, and how different are they? And recently I've done a few videos for my patrons where we explore that. And um, specifically I said to them that you know, it, it, there is almost this idea that there are two Ariantrods or Ariantrods. There's two mm-hmm. specific figures. There's the 
Uh, and that's why I, I tend nowadays to use the Aranshod um, pronunciation mm-hmm. as opposed to Arianshod, mm-hmm. because to me it differentiates Aranshod from Welsh mythology to the Arianshod of um, kind of the, the neo-pagan movement, because she's huge. And it's part of a lot of work that I'm doing at the minute where I'm finding a lot of the Welsh influences on modern pagan witchcraft. So um, how Welsh culture has influenced and inspired a lot of modern pagan witchcraft in general and Ariantrod is one of those threads that just mm-hmm. keeps coming up everywhere so everyone from Doreen Valiente to Vivian Crowley to Paul Hewson all of these huge like witchcraft names have mentioned Ariantrod in their work at some point it's almost like Ariantrod and Gwynapnith are the two kind of gods that come up a lot in mm-hmm. a lot of um, pagan writing from uh, the last century onwards and it, because of that, I found the waters quite muddied. And I remember to, to show how like almost loaded with contradiction and mystery that Ariantrod is. I remember a couple of years back um, sitting in my bedroom with my partner and I was talking about how people interpret Ariantrod as a moon goddess because of her name, Silver Wheel. And that in reality, you know, like the only connection we have to her being a moon goddess is this name. And I, I remember ranting and going, it doesn't make sense to me that we're just basing this off of a name. And then I talked and I talked and I ended up roundabouting my discussion so much that I ended up fighting to to kind of stand behind the idea that actually, yes, she is a moon goddess. <laughs> and that's how... I suppose interspersed she is how amazing she is is that Mm -hmm. she can fulfill these roles and you can make sense of it in so many ways and she's rather wonderful so yes definitely a badass as well (laughs) and I think um you know I think the cyclic nature of her we work with her specifically we associate with her with uh with 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 a lunar eclipse because she helps us see the pattern right and so that that is kind of the the sense that connects it to her. But I will say this, I just wanted to say um that Ariane Hrode, and, and I'm trying to see the 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 pieces because there is that when when I was writing for my degree, I always said Aran Hrod because in all the Welsh materials. But modern Celtic studies is not just neo-pagan pieces. Ariane Hrode is there as well. And in people like John Cock and uh you know um I'm trying to think who else I was dipping into today. Like a lot of the Celtic studies, you know, um luminaries will call her Ariane Hood as well. So I just wanted to say that it's not just a, a bastardization of the you know pagan kind of a piece, but that, you know, I think it depends probably on whether you're a Harvard educated, perhaps maybe it's more of an ang- Anglis- Anglicized piece. I, I'm not, I'm not entirely certain about where that line is drawn because I've seen it both in both academic and in more informal settings. Yeah. And, and I think what's, brought me to her a lot recently which is really good timing because as i mentioned the silver wheel anthology um devotional is coming out very soon and i'm very excited for it and it's perfect timing because she has been showing up in my life a lot over the last Mm. year or two um and i remember for the last year or so i have been kind of almost shying away from the presence that was coming up in my life Mm. i I remember Mm. she was there and I was turning away from it because of these this confusion I had surrounding who she was. And the thing that made me finally get her on a spiritual level, like, obviously, I've been doing some reading as well. I've been digging my way through things like Rachel Bromwich's mm-hmm. Trioilis Prithine, where mm-hmm. she has the, and then Yvonne Williams and Patrick Ford's work. I've been trying to get a better understanding of who she is from the perspective of academics, but also from mm-hmm. a spiritual perspective, when she finally clicked for me was when I was with the Anglesey Druid Order. Um, we were doing a course on ritual structure within the Druid Order, um, how they do their ritual and magic. So what is the, the 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 way that they go about conducting their ritual and such? And we we did a ritual in honor of Arantrod. And I remember during that, Christopher um, he he mentioned during a kind of meditative ritual task that we that we were doing that. Arantrod's name, one theory that I think comes originally from Ivan Williams, who mm-hmm. predominantly wrote in Welsh, um, unfortunately for those who don't speak Welsh, but fortunately for me, because it means I can go and dig into them. Mm-hmm. Um, one theory surrounding her name is that the Aran, the first part, comes from Garan, which, so it's a mutated form of Garan, which means axle. So mm-hmm. 
her name could literally be translated to mean the still point at the center of the wheel. And something, when, when that was said out loud, the still point at the center of the wheel, something within me just clicked into mm-hmm. place. And I was like, mm-hmm. yes, that mm-hmm. is the presence I've been sensing is that that stillness at the center. And it does quite match who she is in the story as well, because if you think about it, she's not the center point of the story. And yet she is as well. So She sets everything into motion. Yeah. And she is unchanged throughout everything. All of this stuff shifts around her, but she remains. Yeah. As she, just, as she entered, yeah. It's like she is that center point in the wheel as mm-hmm. everything turns around her. So to me, that kind of just blew my mind and made me go, I need to look more into this because she finally makes sense to me now mm-hmm. on a spiritual and a more kind of mm. um, scholarly, I suppose, for lack of a better word, level. So on that subject, while we mentioned um, Anglesey Druid order and such, I wanted to ask, so you've actually visited Wales, haven't you? So mm. I remember a few years back seeing um fun pictures on a certain druid that I'm friends with page of a bunch of ooh, strange looking hooded figures descending <laughs> upon the island. So I was wondering, what was your experience like coming to Wales and what did, did you experience anything profound or transformative in that period? Well, I do. I, I am actually fortunate. I do visit Wales quite often. I've been, you know, 10 or 11 times because uh, we bring groups. We go. That's one of the things I love so much about the Mabinongi is that it tells you where things are. So my first trip was a couple of sisters and I with a car, an OS map and a copy of the Mabinongi. This was before GPS, because as I've said, I think I'm an old. Um, but so we go and we've gone to all of these places. We visit places associated with the goddesses. Uh, you know, we go to Tlin Tegid, we go to Tlin Barwini, and we go to all, all, all the things and we work with the goddesses there and connect in a way that you know uh we, we otherwise can't so uh so i've been transformed by the landscape and we i know we can probably talk more about that in a bit um but there is something to be said about having native people for whom this is their culture uh that it just kind of flows through them uh, uh the, Christopher and uh and, and the members of the order were so generous in sharing uh some of their beautiful sacred places with us um we a bunch of us were uh, there for uh, one of our pilgrimages in Wales and then we, we we spent a couple of days afterwards with the order and uh they hosted us and it was just it was just incredible so there is a difference I mean even places where we've gone to a lot like Beth Bronwyn um there are there are there are things that only people for whom this is their home connect in a way that we cannot. So it, just uh, such a deepening of connection because we've had such, um, you know, immersed guides to to their land. And, uh, and I'm always aware that I'm there as a guest, but to be invited uh, into some of uh, some of these things was just an, an enormous privilege. And yes, of course, I mean, just, um, you know, deepened connections with everything. Brilliant. And that's something that I, I suppose, wanted to talk to you the most about mm. today was that idea of connection. Because um, you know, for me, personally, if somebody comes to me and asks nowadays, uh, I want to connect to say, let, let's choose a goddess like Keritwen, for example. And Keritwen the first that came to my head, because I was at Hintegid just a few days ago. Mm-hmm. You know, I was there at her shores. And for me, if someone said to me, I really feel a pull towards Keritwen. I've read the books, I've read her story, I've done the meditations, I've done all this. What more can I do to connect her, to really feel her deeply in my life? One of the first things I recommend always is, well, let's go, let's go to Hintegid, let's go sit on her shores, let's mm-hmm. go leave offerings to her, let's go sing to her, let's go sing her mm-hmm. songs, let's go recite some of that glorious Taliesin poetry at the lake. And it's such a beautiful experience to be able to do that, to walk through the mythical landscape and feel you know the presence of these these gods these characters these entities however we view them to feel almost as though we're walking in their footsteps Mm -hmm. and since I started putting myself out there a little bit and you know being online there is a lot of people there are a lot of people even oh gosh I can't speak English today there are a lot of people who do have a strong pull towards Wales and our spirits and our gods and our stories 
And, you know, sometimes it's because of some kind of ancestral connection. They they know that their heritage or their ancestry stretches back to Wales. Or sometimes it is just this drawing, this pull towards these stories. And so I get people messaging me from places like Canada and Australia, and New Zealand and the United States uh, and all over, really. I even had someone from Japan <laughs> reach out to me not too long ago and say they've read my book and they want to connect deeper. Mm. And a question I get asked a lot is how does one connect to these stories, these entities, this magic, the spirit of Celtica when they're not here, when they're not on this landscape? And I never feel like I'm fully qualified Mm. to talk on that. So I'm wondering if someone came to you with that question, how do I connect to these spirits, these entities without actually being able to visit what would be your personal recommendation well my recommendation is what is what i did i think there's there are three things that you need to do you need to study you need to practice and you need to be in devotion and i i think all of those together uh create that balance to build a bridge and that's what we're doing we're building a bridge and those who live on the land there's a connection there that is unlike any other it's just the the, the legends are writ large right right where you are you are the inheritor of, of the land and the place that these deities and entities or whatever you want to call it you know arose from you know it, and i think that gods my personal ex, um understanding is that every culture creates their gods as a um, as an intermediary to their relationship with the land with a relationship with place so to know a uh, and to understand the gods of a culture, you have to understand the culture. And to understand the culture, you have to understand the environment, which in large part is the landscape, but can also be, you know, situational, right? The kind of, are you under the plague or are you, have you been invaded by Romans? You know, these are, these are the environments that people live and they create shifts in culture, shifts in connections with the divine. So if you can't be there, if you can't connect with that what other ways in? You have to find that way to build that bridge, a Vauban bid bond, right? So, you know, take that, how, apply it all the ways. And and I think study is important to read the stories of these gods from their primary sources, not through other people's lenses. Um, I think that's important because there are pieces of information that will stand out to you, that would stand out to me. I've, I've been reading these stories for a long time. And when I go back and I read them again, I'm always... Oh, 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 so there, there, there's details in there because there is so, so little that we have it, you know, in terms of things being, nothing was written down during the pagan period. So as someone who wants to be in devotional practice, you have to look at these figures in a particular way. And for me, it's always been through myth. It's been through tale. And I think one of the things that people are resistant about with engaging with them through the tale is because there is a sense that because this is medieval literature, because they're not identified as gods, uh, there's a perception, first of all, that, you know, some evil cackling, you know, monk, you know, changed these divinities, to, you know, Ariane Hode is a bitch because some, some monk decided she was too powerful. So he was going to recast her, but that's not the case at all. They wanted to capture their cultural heritage at a time of transition when one Wales had lost its independence. So I think the stories are as they are in their point of evolution. And to look at them as broken is, you have to, uh, I think it's the wrong way of looking at it. I think that if you love the divinities and are drawn to the divinities of the culture, you have to connect with the culture. You have to understand the context because Again, you understand the people, you understand their gods. So that's a hugely important thing for me. And and that's what connects you to the stream of tradition. The second piece is to find ways of practicing, um, to to find a a context that you can, um, you know, do daily ritual, do daily journey work. I talk a lot about myths, giving us a mythic map to connection. You know, we know how to get to the other worlds through liminalities, but we also see it in, you know, it's over the ninth wave. It's, you know, across across the waters to the islands of the other worlds. There's a map that we've been given if we look at things in a particular way. So we can base our things on what was written before so that you're still within that cultural context. Not only is it a devotional act to do that study, but it connects you with the energy of the divine and so you know i think that intention draws divine attention 
And then finally, there's the devotional piece. And I think this is an important piece to look at from a cultural perspective as well. I always tell, you know, when I talk with my sisters, when I talk with students, uh, I think that um, learning things that are uh, part of Welsh culture is a way of practicing culture. Culture is a practice. It's not something that's in your veins. Learning the language. Language is a huge carrier of culture. Um, it's why I've been pushing myself so hard over the years to try to learn it because I've been having you know, difficulties with it because it opens up so many doors, uh, as I said before about Bladai with his name. Um, but learn traditional crafts. Learn how to carve Welsh love spoons. Uh, learn how to write in Glenion, uh, learn how to, you know, traditional dance and music and song and, you know, ways of being in connection with the culture, this as a devotional act in honor of the divinity that you're seeking to be with. And then you've got all of those three things. You have the study, that is the, well, I should say the study is the foundation. Then you've got the practice, that magical bridge that we build with intention. And then we have that devotion, having a shrine, having images, connecting with images of landscape or collecting blood eye with flowers or, you know, things having to do with Rhiannon's birds or, you know, the symbols that connect with you. Let the myth be the guide. And I think for me, that's always been the strongest bridge is through tail I and mean, everything else builds from there. Oh. One last piece. Listen to people who are native. Let them talk with you about their experiences when they say, hmm, maybe, uh, you know, I, I've seen um, from Web uh, 101, I mean, what, what point? <laughs> From Web 1.0, uh, all of those deity lists, which were like the 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 hallmark of every pagan website out there, uh, I saw Bronwyn always Bronwyn, the 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 Welsh goddess of beauty and love, the Welsh Aphrodite. I'm like, have you read her story? Where is that coming from? But it got repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, and you know it went you know Web 1.0 viral, but. There are these pieces. So, so, um, so to listen, to say, maybe you should read the story, listen to people like you, listen to people like Christopher, listen to, to those who are connected to the culture who say, you know, this, or perhaps that, or maybe here, or that's not okay. Uh, I think that we have to listen to you first. So I'm, I'm glad you think so, because it, it's a, it's something that I think I've been struggling with over the last few months. Um, especially since I started, I'm sorry if you could hear any weird music, there's some kind of party going on outside my, my apartment. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully it's not picking up on the mic. But I'm not hearing anything. one of the things that I have been kind of almost teetering around with lately is things that don't make sense to me. And there is this sense of almost um, people really put their guard up and get defensive when sometimes people just ask a question you know so uh for example in recent months i've been talking a lot about especially with my patrons but also just on on facebook and on instagram and across social media but also within groups that i have here in person we've been discussing how sometimes these these characters these figures these goddesses especially goddesses like especially the the female characters of the mabinogi and our welsh mythology how they are often misrepresented almost or at least represented in a way that is almost unidentifiable for those of us who have grown up with these stories mm -hmm. so to me a, a huge um area where i struggle with is uh arantrod or ariandrod her act or her her role i suppose within a lot of uh modern pagan circles as a mother goddess so it's something that i have always kind of struggled with and almost always when i ask the question people get really defensive and they mm. they pull their own experiences into it and it, it's something that is really hard to do is it's difficult to ask that question of why do you perceive her that way? Why do you see her that way when this is the story we have, when this is the tale we have, you know? Um, to me, she's always been a very transgressive force who instantly shunned motherhood, who didn't want anything mm -hmm. to do with motherhood. And that's the way she has always been represented to me. So when I meet, say, a Wiccan coven from uh, from like Yorkshire, who has Ariandrod as their patron goddess, and they see Ariandrod as the very kind of, sexual beautiful fertile mother goddess there is a part of me that goes 
why why <laughs> like can you explain that to me mm-hmm. but I think it's really hard to ask that question even to even make it clear like I don't that doesn't make sense to me and this is someone who you know I have read the story of a million times and it doesn't make sense to me why you're interpreting her like that uh, and it can cause a little um tension I suppose and it goes back to that um concept that Christopher and I talk about a lot which is the concept of cultural appreciation versus appropriation you know there's Mm -hmm. there's appreciating a culture for what it is or a culture's sets I suppose like our myths our stories there's appreciating the stories but then divorcing them entirely from their original cultural context can sometimes be quite rude almost it comes across almost to us as if like oh why why is this happening Mm -hmm. why are you taking her out of her context and there are sometimes elements of these goddesses as they are expressed within a lot of modern paganism that don't don't make sense to me as as someone who grew up in Wales don't make sense to people who might know their stories as they're actually recorded but it makes sense to them and Mm -hmm. that's because they exist within this almost divorced idea of like they are this goddess and they're not as tied to the cultural context as they originally were but then finding that middle ground of how how do we, as almost like native people who have um, a relationship with these entities from a very young age. So as I was saying, you know, I've learned about these uh, these characters. They were characters initially. They were never taught mm-hmm. to be gods and goddesses to me when I was younger. Uh, how do we, who grew up with them, you know, who we played as them at school, we chose the character that we connected to the most and we play on the playground pretending to be them. Um, and we we acted out their stories during school plays and we dressed up as them on book day and such. Like, how do we, who grew up with them, immersed in our culture, mm-hmm. approach um, you know, talking, having conversations with people in a way that doesn't make us just sound bitter and horrible because I have been accused quite a few mm-hmm. times of being a bully or being rude because I've gone, that's not the Khalid when I know or that's not the mm-hmm. Ariane Trad I know. So I, I don't know. I don't know if, if maybe that's too big of a question for me to put to you specifically, but is there something we could do to make it easier when we're having these conversations? I think that I think you hit upon it because it's it's divorced from the culture. Um, I think that I think there's room. I think that Kel said it right in that in their um, in their love of oral tradition, uh, the gods remained alive. They could change and shift and be reflective. They weren't limited by story, mm-hmm. but because they had become limited by story, because time marches on, culture marches on, to connect with these gods again requires us to go. I think through that threshold of story. But when you've connected with that stream of tradition, where you see where it's come from, where you, then I think they can come alive again with us. I don't think the gods are meant to only have the stories that we know. I think there can be an evolution and a shift. Um, when I was last in Vladiwith's uh, landscape, she, uh, she, she spoke to me through different plants than usual you know it's like you know she is a reflection i know the land will yield what is needed in the space and so you know that was kind of the lesson that i had there um but but it, it was consistent with what came before so i think that there's a difference between those who are participating in the stream of tradition picking up where things have left off so things can continue to evolve uh and i think the practices of neo-pagans are going to do that and then there are those who you know who don't have that uh, it, it's connect it's disconnected it's not participating in that stream of tradition and it's almost this uh neoteric apotheosis i think that they're connecting with her uh there's something about the name, there's something about the image, there's something about it that they're projecting upon. I don't know that it's ever going to connect and become part of that stream. And it may just remain in that area. It won't, it won't have the, it won't be informed or empowered by what come before, you know, that magical, what, what, what is it, that the current, the magical current. But I think, I think two, two more things. One, that if they're growing, if they're changing, if they're in relationship with deity, uh, I think that that's the point anyway of all of it, in my opinion. So, I mean, I think it's doing what it needs to. And I think that if we are, especially for people who are not part of that culture, I think we have a a a, um, a responsibility, especially if we're in a position where we're teaching, especially if we're posting online, to say, my experiences with Ariane Code is of this um, versus in the lore, 
So to make that differentiation between personal experience, UPG always, and what is canonical, what is attested, what is accepted in the lore. I think that that is got to be the, 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 um, the period, the, the thing. So to, to gently suggest that, um, your connection with Ariane Hrod is a personal one, um, that it is your experience. And I think as, as you've said, um, but based on the lore, this is what is known about her. Uh, people are always going to get defensive. They'll get defensive when you say that you shouldn't be culturally appropriating, right? Um, so uh, they get defensive if they if they say, well, yeah, maybe your, you know, 10th great grandmother was Welsh, but that doesn't make you Welsh today. It makes you American with, of Welsh descent. And there is a disconnection between what that means, I think, in, in the two cultures as well. Um, that's a whole other story. So I don't know if that helps or hurts, but, uh, yeah, I, it, I could see where you would want to, you want to preserve, you, you're, you're the caretakers of this tradition that you've inherited because of, by nature of your cultural placement and, uh, lineage. And on the one hand, I, I'm sure it's exciting to say, oh, wow, why are people in New Zealand, you know, worshiping our gods and goddesses? But you also, you know, feel a protective nature of it. You're a caretaker. And so sometimes you have to kind of, you know, pull out the, pull out this, the sword and shields metaphorically. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. unenviable position, but <laughs> I think it's, I think most people don't like to be confronted with those things, regardless of whether it's, you know, Arian Hurd is the, the divine mother goddess or, um, you know, the fact that, you know, you can't really call yourself Welsh if, you know, you've never been to Wales, don't speak Welsh. And, you know, you can just claim it through your great, your 13th great grandmother. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, the conversations are complicated and very <laughs> uh, nuanced, I suppose. Uh, my, my partner always says that uh, when I die, if I die before he does, that he's going to put on my gravestone. There's nuance to this because it's a saying <laughs> I say too much. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's a, that's a great one. Oh, but literally it's, it's so, it's difficult, but also it's like you were saying, when I, when I see people who have this pure love and devotion to, uh, entities that were born here, that were born in the lands that, you know, we walk through every day, mm -hmm. there is this sense of pride that I feel that's like, oh my gosh, you know, our stories are being told halfway across the world mm -hmm. these stories that i grew up with are alive today they're not mm -hmm. they're not just like you're stagnating that they're, they're continuing but then there is that little part of you that when like i said when i was scrolling through tiktok in 2020 and uh, i saw someone say oh Fianon is the goddess of sorcery witchcraft magic and the moon there is a part of me that goes what <laughs> excuse me <laughs> what's happening um and it's finding that balance i think of mm -hmm. uh I suppose appreciating it, but also asking questions when necessary mm -hmm. and going, why, why, why do you view it like this? Because I do, you know, as uh, I don't see myself as particularly scholarly, I don't have a degree or anything like that in Celtic studies. I have not done this in a professional sense. Um, I come from a place of passion and devotion, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So there is a part of me that has imposter syndrome that goes, oh, I don't deserve to talk about this because I've not studied it intensely. But then there's the other part of me that goes, no, you were immersed in the culture. You grew up in it. So you do have a right to talk about it. And you do have that devotional. And, you know, I'm not pretending to be something I'm not. I'm not coming out here pretending that I'm Professor Mara Starling of, I don't know, Bangor Rustwith University or anything like that. Uh, I'm very much open about the fact that, no, I'm a Swinraig, I'm a Welsh witch, I grew up in Anglesey, and this is just my practice. Um, so there is that sense of who am I to, to ask what anyone's relationship with the gods is. But at the same time, it's that sense of protectiveness as well, that almost mm -hmm. like, no, this is the goddess that I grew up with from a very young age. And um, I don't understand where you're coming from with that. So it is complex and nuanced and finding that middle ground. But speaking of, um, so during while you were talking about um, your personal connection to Wales and how you connect to these entities from across the ocean away, uh, you mentioned the sisters, the Sisterhood of Avalon. Mm. So I was wondering if I could pick your brains about the Sisterhood of Avalon. So who are you and what do you do as a sisterhood? Oh, so we are... Um... We are a sisterhood. We've been around, as I said earlier, for almost 30 years. We started off as an online 
community. That's where we first connected. And we have in-person hearth groups and uh, we do trainings and uh, teachings online and we host festivals. We have Iavacon, which is in the spring, which is, has always been online. I think we just did our 10th, 10th year. And we have our Ninefold Festival, which is in the fall in uh, Massachusetts of this year. And um, yeah, so we are a women's community and we're centered in uh, Welsh tradition. We work with five, primarily five Welsh goddesses. And uh, we are inspired by the stories of Avalon. We're inspired by these uh, women's communities, these um uh, we see them in lore, we see them in history, um, the idea of Avalon as a, as a place of healing, as um, to me as an intermediary between uh, this world and the other world, a place of granting of sovereignty and the returning of it, and uh, a place of women's magic and women's community, and uh, there are precedents for this, uh, so many different ninefold groups in different areas, and so there's something inherent in that where we... Um, you know, choosing to come into community in that way. We are, uh, uh, I'm the founder, but we have, uh, we have our board of trustees who takes care of all of our, you know, the, the niggly, um, you know, legal and, uh, you know, organizational bits. And then we have our council of nine. We work on consensus. You know, it is, it is, we try to emulate uh, what, uh, what it would be like to be in sacred sisterhood in community in that way. Oh, yes. So I think that one of the uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the Sisterhood of Avalon in the first place is just that I think it's another way of connection, really. It's another method of connecting the fact that you've built this thing that is so uh, almost um, expansive now that, uh, you know, to me, I always knew who the Sisterhood of Avalon was before I really came uh, to like speak at the Ninefold Festival when you did it online and such. But uh, just knowing that there are groups like yours out there who have this devotion to uh, so much of what, you know, sets my heart on fire is it, it's, mm-hmm. it's quite beautiful. And um, am I right in saying that, is it Ninth Wave Press that um, runs the devotional books that That's come out? Correct. Are they yes. related to you as the sisterhood? So there are, there are publishing arm. So yeah, so it's, it's us and uh, our publishing because, because of some of what you've talked about, I think that um, because of the way that things work, I think the, the thing that is the most surface is the easiest to connect when it comes to working with any entities or divinities. And so we wanted to be able to say, you know, maybe Hrannan isn't the goddess of magic and enchantment and moon or whatever it was that you had encountered. This is our experience of her. So we're doing ones of all of these all of the goddesses that we work with. And, you know, some of us come to it from a scholastic piece. Some of it is very kind of, just as you said, you know, emotional and experiential, and it's really clear what all of those things are. And so we want to offer our experiences with working with these goddesses for so long because we are an active, you know, relationship with them individually so it's going to be as different as each of us um you know so that's the power of the anthologies but we we're trying to set um set a conversation of how to approach these divinities in the ways that has worked for us as well yeah and, and in doing so you are making a lot of this accessible for people because you know i know that for me a lot of the reaction i had to when i started my youtube videos when i started my tiktok and then eventually came out with my book and such a lot of the reactions i received were oh my gosh people don't talk about this enough you know mm. like the welsh stuff uh is pretty hard to get even within the general subject area of celtic uh right. things finding that welsh material can sometimes be a gold mine mm-hmm. so the fact that you offer that is such a gift to the world as well mm. and uh, even i am extremely grateful that you do that because as i said i've got the flower face anthology on my shelves i've got your pagan portals um uh, and then also some of your arthurian books are over there i can see them from the corner of my eye <laughs> and it's just the fact that we have more voices speaking on these things and that you're providing a community as well Mm. gives people that sense of connection that I think a lot of people are looking for nowadays Mm. and I just um I suppose wanted to be that annoying person and ask something um a bit I suppose intimate about the, the sisterhood and that is based on an experience that I had where I uh recommended some of your books to some friends of mine um and they said to me well you know, I know who Jenna Andrea is. I know who uh, she is. I know her work. I know about the, the Sisterhood of Avalon and all this. 
But as so the person I was talking to was saying that he was a, a trans person and he was worried that the work would not be as open to him as it would be to, say, a, a cis woman. And I suppose what I'm asking in this is, is the sisterhood open and inclusive to people like me, for example? And it's a silly question to ask, considering I have worked with you in the past. But just to put it out there for people, mm. what is your stance on that? And who is your work for? Is your work specifically only for cis women or is it more expensive? Well, I really appreciate that you asked the question. I know it's not an easy question to ask. And we are. We are a an inclusive sisterhood. All women are welcome in our sisterhood. Um you know, the things that we put out there, they're, you know, we're very specific. Uh, some of our offerings online or, you know, in person are for women only, but, uh, and, and that's all women. Um, and so we have members, uh, of, of all that, that encompass all, um, iterations of womanhood or we're all women here. Um, and, uh, the work that I do when I teach at conferences or festivals, um, the, things that show up in my books. Anyone can pick them up and read them. Um, anyone can come and attend. I'm not giving, be, and, and part of the reason for this is this, you know, we are a sisterhood because we're emulating these, you know, I like to call them these druid adjacent uh, or, uh, you know, kind of uh, communities. And, you know, Avalon was nine sisters. There are these, you know, th- there, so there is this historical precedent. And I did personally come into paganism from a feminist perspective. I self uh, initiated uh, in, in Diana Wicca. That was my first, you know, way in. And I do know that uh, it is sometimes hard to find inclusive places in women's communities in neo-paganism. And I, and I'm sorry that that is an experience, but that is not our, that is not where we come from. We welcome all women. And what was I saying? I was down, I was down a particular path. Ah, to say that the things that are out there, uh, I don't teach mysteries. I teach practice. I give, um, you know, discussion of the lore. I try to give an explanation of where I'm coming from. You know, the, the, the systems and the, and the techniques and tools are an amalgamation of my reading those mythic maps and my studies of occultism, uh, to, to create this, um, process to create uh, I see myself as a container creator or a tool builder, but what is woven is where the mysteries are. And if someone who is male identified, um, picks up my book and resonates with it. And many do. Uh, and you get where you need to go. It's not up to me to decide whether I'm not Avalon's gatekeeper. Uh, if you cross that threshold to the Holy Isle using these tools and techniques, then you are meant to be there. And it's not up to me to make that determination at all. I'm just following that, um, that, uh, that, that, um, woman-centered heritage um, with the understanding that it's out there. And I've had men email me or come to me at conferences and either ask permission to use this work or uh, ask forgiveness for using the work. And again, I just say, if it resonates with you, it helps you to grow and shift. It brings you into a relationship with the divine, with aspects of yourself, with your sovereignty. If it brings you to the holy aisle, uh, then 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 so be it. Uh, you're, you're meant to be there. Um and, and and also to say, you know, Avalon, the, the women of Avalon were servants. They, they they were in service. Priestessing to me, to us, is a verb. It's something that you do. And that doing is to be a bridge. And um, so they healed, you know, I don't know if you can see, but I've got, you know, Arthur behind me here. Um, he's being tended, you know, the last sleep of Arthur in Avalon. So so men were there and they received whatever the offerings that you know, these nine full sisterhoods, they were in service to their community. So our teachings are about, you know, training priestesses to be in service to everyone. And if um, people are drawn to that from different perspectives, um, use the tools with my, with my, with my blessing. Um, and, uh, you know, it, again, it's not up to me to decide whether you're worthy. That's, that's, that's for you to find the threshold and cross it. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for being uh, so gracious with the response there. I know it's a mm-hmm. it's a difficult topic, but I wanted to bring it up because it is something that I think a lot of us struggle with uh, as mm-hmm. like queer as trans pagans nowadays. Uh, I know for me personally, I've had conversations in the past with people where I've said, if something is women only, and they do not explicitly make clear uh, somewhere in the site or whatever that 
you know, that they are welcoming of trans women, or as you said, welcoming of all women, then there is a part of me that thinks, well, that's that space mm-hmm. isn't for me. And there's also been, you know, a bit of an uptake lately of people utilizing a lot of this language and a lot of this idea of empowering women. Uh, utilizing it to be at best uh, exclusionary and at worst cruel. So it's nice to just be able to talk to someone who is open about it. And I can say very openly, hand on heart, as a transgender woman, as a as a pagan, as a witch who is uh, trans as well, I can say very, very openly that nothing in your work has ever struck me as being exclusionary. And I've always felt extremely welcomed alongside mm. the sisterhood and alongside anyone that works alongside you. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask that question just to open up that conversation for anyone who might be curious. Because as I said, I have had people come to me and say, mm. hey, have you heard of Jenna? What do you think? <laughs> so it's nice to hear it from you as well. So that kind of brings us to... Uh, somewhat close. So I just wanted to ask you really, before we finish this off, do you have anything you'd like to share? Anything that you'd like to plug perhaps? Anything to put out there into the world? Well, you've been very graciously mentioning uh, several of the things that are forthcoming. So we do have our Ninth Wave Press Anthology about Ariane Road. And um, and I'm sure, and I know that some of the things within will address some of the things that we talked about in terms of her name and meaning and all of that. Um, so that should be out uh, very soon. And uh, my, my, uh, my, my third book in uh, the Avalon series I'm doing with Llewellyn is coming out on June 8th, which happens to be my birthday. Uh, so double birthday, but uh, the the ninefold path of Avalon. And I'm very excited about this book. It's uh, I call it my mullet book. It's uh, it's all the, uh, the academia in the front and the woo woo in the back. But I think there's stuff for everyone there because I, I really did a deep dive. This is the book I wish I had when I started on my Avalon path. I pulled out all of the source materials, all of the resources, all of the motifs through literature and through history and uh, about Avalon, about Ninefold Sisterhoods, about the symbolism in the mythos, about what were the priestesses, what do we know about the priestesses in Celtic tradition and the holy women uh, from historical uh you know, records from the Romans and the Greeks and, and the Glavin and all the things. And so pulling all of that together and then um, connecting it with this idea of this ninefold sisterhood of Avalon and uh, how to be in relationship with the Holy Isle, how to connect with this idea of the ninefold, which is kind of our... Um, our uh, organizing principle in the sisterhood and has for a long time. So it's an offering of praxis is an offering of, uh, of process. So, you know, if you just want to learn, you've got all of that in the front. And again, if you want to engage, uh, it's a step-by-step, almost painstaking uh, process that, you know, you can adapt or, you know, use as you will, but at any rate, so I'm very excited about this and um, I'm, I'm you know, it comes out into the world soon. So it's kind of on my forefront. So I do appreciate Mara, the opportunity uh, to, to share that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. And I will say, as someone who has read your forthcoming book um, early, thank you so much for that opportunity as well. Um, as I said earlier in the episode, the Arthurian and Avalonian kind of streams were an area that I was always a bit scared of because there's so much, there's so much and you never know, like, who do I trust? Do I trust Geoffrey of Monmouth? Do I trust the Welsh manuscripts? Do I trust the French kind of things? Or is there some other place that I need to come at first? And uh, your book is one that, you know, is um accessible yet deep it has that depth mm-hmm. to it that I think, as you said, a lot of people will appreciate. And I will add the little quote that I wrote for you at the end of this episode as well. So thank thank you you so much, Jenna, for coming on today. And it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope that I can convince you to come back someday to maybe talk about more Athorian, Avalonian things, but we'll see. I think you might be able to twist my arm a little bit. Marvellous. Oh, (laughs) uh, thank you so much. And I hope we will see you very soon. Thank you, Mara. Appreciate it. See you very on. Well, what a wonderful chat. I just want to give out one more big diolch or galon, a huge thank you to Jenna for gifting us with her time and with her wisdom. 
If you'd like to learn more about Jenna, you can purchase her books now wherever books are sold. And all the links to her work and where to find her will be in the description of this episode. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to support the podcast or my work, you can support me over on Patreon for as little as £1 a month. My patrons got access to this episode a month in advance and they always get access to all of the podcast episodes a month in advance to everyone else. Beyond that, they also get a video version of the podcast so they can watch along as we talk about these subjects. If you can't afford to join me on Patreon, then why not leave me a tip over on Ko-fi so I can grab myself a cup of tea while I edit future episodes. But regardless of whether you can support within a financial manner or not, I am so eternally grateful that you are listening to this podcast. All the links, if you do want to support or follow me elsewhere, will be below. So until next time, diolch yn fawr am y minno gyda ni ar hon y podlediad swyn gyfareddol. Thank you for listening to the Welsh Witch Podcast. Diolch yn fawr iawn, bendithion ddisglair. See you next time. <laughs>